In the, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. I'd like to welcome you all to our Perseverance Family Conversation. And as always, it's a great pre pleasure to be with all of you as we draw closer and closer to Holy Week. Actually, next Thursday will be Holy Thursday. We'll enter into the Easter Triduum. So as we draw closer to these days which we see the great love that Christ had for us by dying for us and rising from the dead for our salvation, <clears throat> and giving us the great gift of the Eucharist, how grateful we should be. Let's uh, turn to Mary and ask Mary to pray for us. Mary is the mother of God. Mary is the mother of the church. Mary is the mother of each and every one of us. Also, Mary is our life, our sweetness, and our hope. That's right, Mary is our life, our sweetness, and our hope. So let's turn to Mary and say that prayer that she loves most. And that prayer is the Hail Mary, together. Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and bless the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God. Pray for our sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Now let's invite to be with us in our Perseverance Family Conversation, our spiritual guide. Our spiritual guide or spiritual director is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has many different titles pointing to his work in the world, his work in the church, and his work in each and every one of us. The Holy Spirit is known as the Paraclete. He's also known as the gift of gifts. He's also known as the sweet guest of the soul. Holy Spirit is also known as the counselor. Counselor as well as the consoler. The Holy Spirit is also our interior master. <clears throat> St. Paul says that we really don't know how to pray as we ought. But the Holy Spirit intercedes with ineffable groans so that we can say, Abba. Abba, which means Father. Abba, which means Father. So let's invite the Holy Spirit to be with us and beg for a lot of light in our intellect and the fire of love to burn within our hearts, as we say. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit They shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us that by the same Spirit we may be 
truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our Lady Fatima, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Michael, pray for us. St. Gabriel, pray for us. St. Raphael, Pray for us. Saint Ignatius of Loyola, pray for us. Saint Maria Faustina Kowalska, pray for us. All God's angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, the Holy Spirit, Amen. Well, uh, true it is, my friends, the family that prays together stays together. The family that prays together stays together, and a world at prayer is a world at peace. So today I'd like to place all of you on the altar in the holy sacrifice of the Mass, and by far the greatest of all prayers is the holy sacrifice of the Mass. No greater prayer than the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. I'd like to place you on the altar and offer the following intentions. First would be that all of us would make a concerted effort to be open to the workings of the Holy Spirit to the workings of the Holy Spirit. And we could say this prayer during the course of the day. Come Holy Spirit, come. Come Holy Spirit, come through the heart of Mary. Come Holy Spirit, come. Come Holy Spirit, come through the heart of Mary. My next intention, I'd like to pray for your families, place them on the altar, especially your, your family members who have walked away from God, who have walked away from God. That they would return. And they would be saved. So in these holy days, as we draw close to the Holy Week, as well as the Easter Triduum, that the loved members of our family would open up their hearts to the love of God and be saved. My last intention My last intention will be to pray for the dying. Today, throughout the world, many people will die. In many places, in many different manners, they will die. And right after that, they'll be judged by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ upon their whole life. Let's pray for those who are dying who are not ready. That they would be converted and be saved. Never forgetting that our soul has infinite value. Our Lord himself has said, What does it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lose his soul? 
So those will be my intentions. <clears throat> A brief recap of yesterday, then we'll enter into the readings for today. <clears throat> yesterday we made a comment on the first reading which was taken from the prophet Daniel, <clears throat> which King Nebuchadnezzar ordered the three Jewish young men who were in his court Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego to bow down in front of a, a statue that the king had made, made. Now they would be thrown into the burning furnace With a determined determination, the three young men said, under no condition will we bow down and worship a, a statue to worship an idol. Worshiping a statue, worship an idol. The king's face, Nebuchadnezzar, was livid with rage. And he told his soldiers to heat up the oven seven times more. So much so that some of the his soldiers were actually burned to death. Then from the orders of the king, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego were thrown into the fire. And instead of being burnt, they're walking around in the fire, and there was a fourth man that looked, that looked like the Son of God. And the king recognized that the God of <coughs> Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego <coughs> Their God was the true God. My comment yesterday was the, the reality of idols and idolatry. They gave you a definition. The nature of an idol is when we place any person place, thing, idea, above God. So anything, anything, any place, any object, any idea has the potentiality of being an idol. Anything. Anything has the potentiality of being an idol. Before moving into the readings today, I'd like to mention just a few. I and mean, I spent yesterday most of the time just on talking about the idol of narcissism. I call it, instead of the blessed trinity, it's the egotistic trinity. Me, myself, and I. I'd like to mention five of the chief idols in the American society.
The first is materialism. Materialism in which we place the material above the spiritual. We place time above eternity. We place our body above our soul. We place pleasure over sacrifice. We place the fleeting and the transitory above the eternal. Materialism. Many are absorbed and blinded by materialism. The second would be consumerism. And one's going to lead to the other. If I am absorbed and dominated and enamored with the materialistic mindset, then what is spawned and flows from that is consumerism. I want to go and, and I want to buy. They're related. And the best way to explain that would be Black Friday. Black Friday after Thanksgiving is a day when people go to shop. Shop until you drop. How many people in our society are dominated by materialistic philosophy spawning out to consumerism. Then what follows upon that is what is called hedonism. Hedon hedonism would be diametrically opposed to what is called the spirit of sacrifice. Hedonism it's a word that comes from Greek, and it means the philosophy of pleasure. Eat, drink, and be merry. Live it up. You got one life to live, go for it. It's Miller time. You deserve a break today at McDonald's. And as the waitresses will say when they sit you down, enjoy, enjoy. Not to say enjoying a good meal is wrong, but if the end purpose of our life is just to maximize pleasure, that has become our idol. And then many people end up Many people end up in embracing agnosticism and then atheism. What is atheism? Atheism, my friends, is the categorical denial that there is a supreme being. In other words, that God does not exist. God is just a figment of your imagination. And he who is responsible for the promotion of modern atheism is a man, his name is Karl Marx, who wrote Das Kapital, And the Russians embraced this back starting 1917, which they would say the religion is the opium of the people. 
you want to pacify or assuage the huge multitude, just let them have religion as a baby, as a pacifier. The Second Vatican Council in the dogmatic constitution got him its best claims that there are two types of atheism. There is dogmatic philosophical atheism where the person simply says that God does not exist and that's it. Like Hawkins and company. But then Vatican II, God its best, states that there is also what is called practical atheism. Now, practical atheism is the following. That the individual says that he or she believes in God, but denies God by the way he lives. If you look at that person, the way he lives, his lifestyle, his actions, it certainly doesn't, he certainly does not reflect God at all. It's opposed to what Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And then Jesus says, you are the light of the world. I am the light of the world, and you are the light of the world. Vatican II, God in respect, continues by saying that one of the biggest scandals in the world is the dichotomy between the faith that we profess with our lips and the lives that do not reflect what we say with our lips. It's called a scandal. The dichotomy between the faith that we profess with our lips and then the life that we live, which does not reflect the presence of Christ whatsoever. The Argentinians have a phrase. I'll say it in Spanish and then in English. Escribir con la mano y borrar con el codo. Write with your hand and then erase with your elbow. Then the last thing I'd like to say, finishing up our conversation on idolatry, Is another, it's a big word, but important that we understand is called utilitarianism. Utilitarianism was promoted by John Stuart Mills and Jeremy Bentham, who were political scientists in the 19th century. And basically, what <coughs> utilitarianism embraces and promotes is that the individual the individual has worth and value in commensurate with or in proportion to what he has economically or what he's able to produce economically Once again, utilitarianism 
which has dominated the thoughts of many Americans. It means that you have value. Your value can be measured in proportion to how much money you have, how many possessions you have, and how capable you are of making more money and accumulating more possessions. Very much related to materialism and consumerism. They all tend to work together. So the net result of utilitarianism would be, I'll give you an example. A woman goes to uh, have a pregnancy test. And the doctors say that the baby within has an extra chromosome. Which means it's going to be a child with Down's syndrome. Now the way that the person who's embraced materialism, consumerism, and utilitarianism would be such. Better, better to abort because that Down's child will not be able to become a millionaire that Down's child will just be a burden to society. Better just to eliminate the child before the child is even born. That would be the philosophy and the consequences of living out utilitarianism. Or you have grandma who's 85 senile and on dialysis better just end her life. What's the purpose of her living? Just pull out the plug. So my friends, I thought it would be opportune that I just finish, give the finishing touches to the book of Daniel and Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego would not bow down to the statue. We should make a firm decision that we will not bow down to the modern idols, which start off in the mind, a, it's a wrong philosophical system that we absorb in our minds. Then we act it out. My father would often say, the thought is the father of the deed. What we think upstairs, we end up by acting out in our lives. So the readings today, my friends, we have, we go back to the book of Genesis, chapter 17. We encounter Abram whose name is changed to Abraham. Then we have Psalm 105. The antiphon is the Lord remembers his covenant forever. Then we're continuing with John chapter 8. Was Jesus himself debating with the Jews, talks about Abraham. Abraham as the father of faith. And Jesus reveals his name, which is I am. That's really what Yahweh means, I am. And I, man, I, I am is one of God's attributes, and it means that God, God is, is existence. God always existed. God exists now and God will exist for all eternity. So, let's, uh, 
let's uh, talk about this passage with Abram. An overall view of the Old Testament, my friends. The Bible has uh, two essential parts. You've got the Old Testament and then you have the New Testament. In the heart of the New Testament would be the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The Old Testament, the three most important figures in the Old Testament would be Abram, whose name was changed to Abraham, that we have in the reading today. Then we have the person of Moses. And then finally we have King David. Those would be the three most important figures in the Old Testament. Abraham, Moses, and David. So today we have a short passage from Genesis chapter 17. I'd like to pull out a few ideas for our reflection and meditation. Starts off by saying, Abram prostrated himself. So we have Abram prostrating himself, and then God speaks to him. Let's talk a little bit about Abram prostrating himself. What does that mean? Well, the prostrate is to place yourself on the ground with your head and your forehead to the ground. I'll give you some examples and then what does that mean to prostrate oneself? Abram prostrate himself. Moses before the burning bush. He prostrates himself. Then we have the three kings that came to visit the child Jesus. They prostrate themselves before Jesus and they open up their coffers. And they present to him three gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then Jesus, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prostrates himself and prays to the Eternal Father. Father, if it be possible, remove this chalice from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Then an approved private revelation referring to Our Lady Fatima, 1916, the three little children, Jacinta, Francis, and Lucia, they encountered the guardian angel three times. The last time the guardian angel prostrates himself and there suspended the air is the chalice as well as the host. And the garden angel teaches the children a prayer. My God, I believe in you, I adore you, I worship you, I beg pardon for those who do not believe in you, I adore you, I worship. Eternal Father, I offer you the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and all the tabernacles of the world in reparation for those who do not love you, do not worship you, do not adore you. And the children were saying this prayer of adoration and reparation before the chalice and the hose that were suspended in the air. One last idea of prostration is, maybe two, 
is when a deacon or a priest, when a deacon or a priest is about to be ordained, he prostrates himself on the ground before the bishop. and all pray in silence for a short time. Then eight days from today will be Good Friday. There's no Mass, but there's a Good Friday uh, Eucharist. It's a Good Friday Eucharist. I mean, a Good Friday celebration. The priest comes out dressed in red and he prostrates himself there on the ground. So I've given you <coughs> quite a few examples of prostrate, starting with Abram. God did not speak to Abram until he prostrates himself before God. Very interesting. It is very, very interesting. To prostrate, it's... <clears throat> no, we speak, my friends through words, but also we speak, we communicate through gestures. Through words or through gestures. That's right. Through words or through gestures. In one gesture, we make the genuflection adoring the Blessed Sacrament, but prostration is a gesture that has is packed with meaning. By prostrating oneself on the ground, it's a gesture of humility. And the word, the word humility comes from humus, which means earth. You're close to the earth. Also, it's a symbol of penance. It's a penitential gesture. Why did the king of Nineveh and the Ninevites, they prostrate themselves and they put on sack, sackcloth and ashes? Also, it's, it can be also a gesture of adoration. Also is a gesture of submission. Also it can be symbolic of dependence, that we are dependent upon God. As St. Paul, St. Paul quoting the, the Greek po poet in relating to God, in him we live and move and have our being. To God, in him we live and move and have our being. So Abram prostrates himself before God. I would not suggest that you're prostrating yourself before God in the church publicly. However, in the private of your room, you can prostrate yourself before God. There's nothing wrong with that. For that reason, St. Ignatius of Loyola says it's a good idea to pray in your room. As you're praying in your room, you can, you can prostrate yourself and 
Only God sees that. That's right, only God sees that. Only God sees that. Only God sees that. So prostrate. Abram prostrates himself. Then it says God spoke to him. I like that juxtaposition. I think there's a real connection between Abram prostrating himself before God, then God speaks to him. You might see it this way. You remember the parable of the Pharisee and the publican in Luke chapter 18? You remember that? is that the publican stood in the background and he struck his breast and said, God have mercy in me, a sinner. Whereas the Pharisee was standing up and he's basically praising himself for his prayers, his fastings, his tithes, and that he was not like the rest of sinful humanity. Which of those two went home justified? Not the Pharisee. Really, he wasn't praying. He was just praising himself. But rather, rather, it was the publican. The publican because of his great humility. <clears throat> because of his humility. A broken and humble heart, O Lord, you will not spurn. Mary says, God cast down from the, their throne the proud, but he lifts up the humble. Jesus himself said many times, God humbles the proud, but he exalts the humble. So it's important, my friends, that we try to try to be humble. God loves the humble, the humble of heart. You may you might even pray this short prayer. Jesus, meek and humble of heart, make my heart like unto yours. God spoke to Abraham. God wants God wants to speak to you today. He can speak to you through Father Broom and our perseverance conversation. God can speak to you when you're reading and meditating the word of God. God can speak to you when you're making your holy hour. God can speak to you through persons that God places in your path. God can speak to you through circumstances. God can speak to you in the very depths of your heart through inspirations, God can speak to you. So as God spoke to Abram, God wants to speak to each and every one of us. 
Our best friend should be our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And what God said to Abraham was, My covenant with you is this. You are to become the father of a host of nations. You are, you are called to become a father to a host of nations. Let's talk briefly about fatherhood. We could spend the whole time talking about father and fatherhood, but just a couple ideas. Qualities of a father. First point I would highlight is a father. The nature of the father is life. Father allows life to be generated. So what is the antithesis of a father would be, for example, a the abortion itself. When a woman carries out abortion, behind the woman is the father that has been instrumental in the conception of that child. So when there's an abortion, if the, the man who is responsible for that conception promotes it or does nothing whatsoever, that he also is responsible for that abortion. So the first note of a father is a father says yes to life. That's right. Father says yes to life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Then another salient note of a father is the father is called to provide. He's called to provide for his family. When Adam and Eve committed the sin, God told Eve to bring forth children in pain. Then to Adam, to Adam, he said, you will bring forth bread by the sweat of your, sweat of your brow. So a true father is called to provide for his family. Let's talk a minute about that. There are many fathers that have good qualities in the sense that they will work day and night to provide for their wife and for their children and for their household. True. Economically, materially, this uh, father bends over backwards to provide for his family, which is very noble and, and worthy of praise. However, when that father comes home, from work, he's tired. But he should try to be available for his wife and for his children. True economically, but also he should be available emotionally for his children, socially for his children by means of communication with his children. Morally for his children. When I say morally, I mean it's incumbent upon the father to form the character and the moral foundation of his children. Spiritually, 
spiritually. Spiritually in the sense that he's called to be. When I was in Argentina, Father Antonio Fontana was my superior. He's passed away since. Very good priest. An Italian priest. And he would insist that the father has to be the priest of the family. El sacerdote de la familia. He would say, the father has to be the priest of the family. And that means he has to be the spiritual head of the family. So as Abram was called to be the father of a host of nations, we're extrapolating upon this by speaking about the whole concept of fatherhood and what it means to be a good father. <clears throat> what it means to be a good father. <clears throat> How important it is in the modern world that we have Fathers, as the Protestant pastor Adrian Rogers said in his wonderful command of the English language, we have too many dropout dads. Too many dropout dads in the modern society. If you really want to see the whole dynamic of fatherhood, it's not a bad idea to go to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15, in which you have the lost and found parables. The lost sheep and the sheep that is found. The lost coin and the coin that is found. Then you have the lost son and the son that is found. That is called the parable of the prodigal son. However, we can even call it the parable of the merciful father. That's right, my friends. The parable of the prodigal son or the parable of the merciful father. The parable of the prodigal son, but also the parable of the merciful father the parable of the merciful father is focusing more, focusing more on the person of the father than on the transgressions of the son. They're both important. Parable would fall apart if you didn't have both. But one of the most salient virtues or characteristics of the father present in the parable of the prodigal son of the merciful father is the patience of the father, but also the love that the father had for the son. And all the qualities of a true, authentic father in the world would and should be that a father loves God the Father, but a father also, he has an infinite love for his family and for his children. So my friends, 
we've had a very good conversation today, indeed. We've had a very good conversation. And I'd like to invite all of you, before I give you my fatherly, priestly blessing, I invite all of you to share our message. Many of you have many friends. Share our message in our Perseverance family to your friends. So that we would grow in number, but also we would grow in holiness. Now I'd like to give you my fatherly, my priestly blessing. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. May God bless you and we'll see you tomorrow.